a mind-boggling amount of money. Tens of trillions of dollars worth of monetary and fiscal stimulus has been issued around the world since the pandemic broke out last year. How can the boost to the economy from such a massive flood of money already be over? It's not just China. It's also in Japan. Toyota's been cutting production as well, too, because of the global supply and the chip shortage. It's across Korea. It's across Vietnam. And so it's really starting to show up that the global economy, especially out of Asia, is slowing. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Adam Taggart, founder of Wealthion, welcoming you back for another week of making sense of money and the markets so that you can make better informed decisions about building your wealth. The world has become a lot more volatile over the past few weeks. Markets are lurching up and down as investors have become suddenly concerned about contagion, and not just from the new COVID variants, but contagion from the failure of big players in China like Evergrande and contagion from rising input costs caused by both stimulus and snarled global supply chains. How worried should we be and what are the likely implications? To tackle these important questions, I'm thrilled to welcome Jim Bianco back onto the program. Jim is president and macro strategist at Bianco Research, where he provides objective, incisive commentary that challenges consensus thinking across monetary policy, the intersection of markets and politics, the role of government in the economy, fund flows, and positioning in financial markets. Jim, so happy to have you back on the program today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Adam. Thanks, Jim. Well, you're a busy guy, so we're going to jump right into it. I do want to start with a question I like to ask all my guests. What is your current assessment of today's global economy and financial markets? Global economy is slowing. It's definitely uh, being led by Asia and in particular China as far as it's slowing. In fact, I think in China, it's unmistakable that the data is turning south. Um, let me jump into Evergrande a little bit. Evergrande is a large levered property firm in China that's borrowed hundreds of billions of dollars and is on the verge of either defaulting or maybe finding some kind of a negotiated settlement to at least make their latest interest payments. Most of the time when you see that, like Lehman Brothers, it's a symptom. It's a symptom of a problem in the economy. It's not a cause of a problem. Lehman was a symptom of the housing market collapsing uh, and it owned too many mortgages. Evergrande is a symptom of the slowdown in the global economy and in particular in Asia, uh, in China. And when you have a highly levered real estate firm in, a very, in an economy that's slowing dramatically, you run into problems. You also have seen that too, the way that the Chinese government has been cracking down on a lot of their firms. But it's not just China. It's also in Japan. Toyota has been cutting production as well, too, because of the global supply and the chip shortage. It's across Korea. It's across Vietnam. And so it's really starting to show up that the global economy, especially out of Asia, is slowing. Financial markets, that's a different question. I, you know, you could, I, I personally think you break down financial markets into two groups. And these are not the typical groups people break them down into. Group one is the stocks and the indexes that constantly get inflows of money and people buy them. So I'm talking about spiders. I'm talking about ETFs. I'm talking about every day people wake up and say, I'm going to put money in the market. Just go buy me some spiders. And you get this relentless inflow of money and pushes those up. When you get away from the index flows, even if you look at small cap stocks in the US and then you start looking at foreign stocks, boy, it's really kind of sideways uh, on a lot of those markets as well, too. And it really reflects, I think, this slowing of the global economy. All right. So, uh, so many places, directions to go with that. But why don't I ask uh, one that's on the top of my mind, probably many viewers. So, Jim, we just dumped trillions. I mean, maybe dozens of trillions, but trillions and trillions of, of dollars worth of monetary and fiscal stimulus around the world over the past 18 months or so. And things are slowing again. Uh, are we just basically going to get uh, T-shirts that all said, hey, the world spent uh, a couple of tens of trillions of dollars and all we got was this lousy T-shirt? Yeah, and a T-shirt's going to get more expensive next month and more expensive <laughs> the month after that uh, as well, too. Yeah, I think part of the problem... With the, the with the spending of the money is is that 
let me back up. I think that when we come out of this pandemic and I'm like, let's jump ahead 10 or 15 years and we look at 2020, we're going to look at 2020 a lot like the Great Depression was looked at, a lot like World War II was looked at, that this was a, a, a transformational period in the way that we behaved. In the, in the 1930s, the transformational period was about borrowing debt. Those of us that are old enough, like my grandparents, probably your grandparents, they just would never borrow. Even though they had the means, they wouldn't show their wealth. They were just, they were scarred by the Great Depression. I think that a lot of things have changed transformationally because of, the, uh, of COVID. And I think it's around work. And let me just say it bluntly to get my point across. What we've all known is working in a big company, in a big office tower, in the middle of a big city, kind of a crappy job. And we don't really like it. And we don't really want to go back to those jobs. And that's why companies are having such a difficult time getting people back to work. And so therefore, they're going to have to start paying up to get them back to work. In the meantime, other people are finding that they don't really want to go back to factory jobs. They want to you know, rethink about what it is they want to do. So we have a supply shortage and a chronic supply shortage. So all that money that we've dumped into the economy is stimulating demand, but we can't get people back in the office unless we pay them more. And we can't get them to make stuff unless we pay them more. And now I think we're starting to see the beginnings of, and I'll use a, Fred, a Fed phrase, persistent inflation, although they like to say that it's transitory inflation. And I think that, yeah, so that's why you were saying about we're going to get that T-shirt that we dumped all this money in the market and all I got was this T-shirt. And that's why I quipped to you, yeah, that T-shirt's going to get more expensive next month and the month after that, because I think that the inflation that we're generating is more persistent because we're still, we're trying to tell people to go back to 2019, get back to that big office building, go back to that factory job. And they're saying, look, I sat at home for a month and, or for a year, and I've kind of realized I don't really like that job and I don't really want to go back to it. And so it's incumbent upon businesses to remake those jobs and make them more attractive. One way to make them more attractive is to pay them way more or, you know, maybe make the quality of life uh, more enticing for people to want to do it. So there's a lot of issues that we're going to have to really deal with. Well, there really are. Um, all right. So you're looking at that with a, you know, 15 year retrospective. Um, but right now, you know, you, we're, we're talking about, um, we're talking about rising input costs, right? I mentioned that a bit in the intro. So we, we pumped all this money um, you know, out there that is beginning to, to find its way into um, base input costs. At the same time, the global supply chain really is kind of just a, a, a mess right now. It's just a tangle, um, both in terms of um, you know, supply chains not having recovered from the initial disruption, uh, but now we've got congestion at ports. Uh, there's some speculation that China may even be sort of weaponizing its supply chains a little bit uh, for, for potential agendas. Um, but the long story short is that the prices of many essentials for living have gone up double digits since last year. Um, and then there's the potential monetary inflation on, on top of that. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe job prices will need to go up and maybe companies will need to keep rising them to attract people back. But you know, the slowing growth that you're talking about is deflationary. So we kind of have this collision of, of counterbalancing macro trends here. It's gonna be interesting to see sort of which ones went out. Um, a, I'd love your, just your response to that in general, but B, on the, on the job side of things, maybe we can kind of dig into uh, you know, uh, how long can the consumer remain choosy here with rising input costs and the, uh, the expiration of um, what was essentially sort of a type of UBI, which was the emergency uh, benefits that have been issued out there. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see how much consumer, the, the, the worker has a lot of leverage right now. Will they have a lot of leverage in a year if growth slows so much that companies are beginning to struggle? and you know, uh, having to cut back and whatnot. So I'll stop talking, because, but there's a lot going on. Basically my point is there's a lot of cross currents going on. What do you see kind of resolving through all the smoke here? Yeah, that's what I was trying to say in the last section was that the, the, how long can the consumer hold on? How long can people hold on without a job? They can't, they can't. They're struggling right now, but they are. And the reason they are, again, I think is there's a wholesale transformational rethink. So yeah, how, you know, we have to start thinking about 
everybody's thinking about this differently now. And so that the, the 2018, 19 rules are not applying because it is incredible that we've got all of these jobs. We've got all these people that, that are out of work. Uh, you know, the, the local Walgreens a block from my house is still got a card table in front, sign up, take an interview, get a hundred dollar gift certificate just to take an interview. Um, I once quick quip to my wife, I forgot my wallet once. Maybe I'll sign up for a quick interview so I can pay for the stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? Hey, hey Angie, man, I, I hate to interrupt you there, but I just, in your answer, if you can address the, the, the question that people would have, which is yes, but maybe we kind of created that by, by paying people enough money not to be able to turn down those jobs uh, for the past year. But now as of Labor Day, you know, those benefits have expired in all states and maybe we're just those people aren't desperate enough yet to, or, or incented enough yet to consider those jobs because they still have a bit of a cushion saved up, but that cushion may, may run out in the next couple months. Sorry to interrupt your train, but I just wanted no, to No, no, you're, you're right. Let me back up and say, look, we started, we started reducing the $300 a week that the federal government was offering in June. And by the end of July, 25 states, they were all Republican states, had ended it. And on at beginning of September, the other 25 states have ended it. You go through the, uh, the, the data and indeed.com has done it as, as well as some other people. It's hard to say that there's been a difference. It's incredible. Think about what you said and you're right. It's incredible. I lost my $300 a week. I still have enough savings that I don't need to go find a job for another six, seven, 10 weeks. Even though if I go to Walgreens, they'll give me a hundred dollar skip certificate. And I can start this afternoon. Now, 2019, you jump over the table to grab that job before it went away because right. you didn't know what the what the future was going to hold. But today, I'm going to wait until my last dollar is spent, and then maybe I'll start looking sheepishly for a job. My point is that is a transformational rethink that goes well beyond the extra money that's going on. And that's why what I was trying to say is, I think there's something more going on here than we just didn't, we just paid people to stop working. I think that they, that they're, they, the sitting at home a year, like the Great Depression, has changed their view of the world and has changed attitudes. Now, I'm not going to tell you, I know what it is, but I'll tell you what it isn't. It isn't, we're going to go back to 2019 uh, as well. So I do think that lots of things have changed about the economy. And I think that that's why it's been very difficult for a lot of, whether it's investors or economists or, or executives, because they're still using, well, in 2019, this is the way the world worked. Doesn't work that way anymore. All right, so totally get it. There is a, there is a cultural shift that has happened. We don't yet really know exactly what the, the full ripple effects are gonna be, but kind of like uh, you know letting the lion out of the cage at the zoo, going to have a hell of a hard time getting that lion back in the cage once he's tasted a little bit of freedom. So, yeah, and, uh, and if I could jump in, I think yeah. what the freedom is, and, I, and I'll put it again, bluntly, get my point across. I kind of think they kind of like working in front of their computer in their pajamas at home. And that's kind of what they want for a job. And they don't want to have to schlep down to an office or schlep to an, uh, uh, a store or schlep to a factory or something along those lines. They liked the freedom, the flexibility that work from home gave them and they want to keep it that way and the problem is a lot of executives and a lot of managers they're not equipped to manage people over the long term remotely they've always managed them supervised them in a centralized location known as an office or a factory or something so that's where i think the struggle is right now yeah and it'll be interesting because i'm sure there's there's you know pros and cons on both sides um but certainly there's a lot of potential for, you know, if, as long as you can keep product productivity high enough, there's a lot of cost savings not to have to, you know, build or rent a massive office building and all the overhead that goes on in there. And hey, if your employees are having a higher quality of life while getting their jobs done, who's going to want to argue with that, right? And not not right. all different types of professions can be virtualized like that, but you're right. You know, there's the, we, we sort of shook up the box here and it's going to be interesting to see where all the pieces fall when they, when they finally land. Um, but you know, to your point, it, it, it is turmoil and uh, we're going to have to figure our way through that, particularly those companies that are just not equipped uh, to be able to react fast enough. Um, all right. And that brings us then to some additional shaking of the box here on the macro side of things. Um, 
I, I probably do want to ask you a question or two more about China, but let's just talk really briefly uh, about the Federal Reserve because there was a Federal Reserve meeting today. Um, I've been heads down in interviews, really haven't had a chance to bring myself up to speed on it. I know that you said you watched it. Um, sounds like wasn't a ton of, of uh, remarkable uh, announcements there, but, but tell us what you took away from it. Yeah, um, it was largely expected. Um, there was a, quip, a couple of things on the margins that were a little bit different, but not significant. And that is the Federal Reserve, basically Jay Paul all but announced that they're going to start tapering their bond purchases at the November 3rd meeting. Now, what that means is the Fed buys $120 billion worth of bonds every month uh, and expands their balance sheet by that much. So they're going to, and he said that they want to do it so that they could be at zero in mid 2022. So in English, what that means is they're going to go from a hundred billion to, I mean, from 120 billion to a hundred billion to 80 to 60 to 40 to zero purchases. So by mid 2022, they would be done with their purchases. And then we can, then we could start the parlor game as to when the first rate hike is going to start. He said that they'll do it. Pro he didn't say November, but he said that he thinks that they've met all their objectives unless there's a problem with the October payroll report, a uh, September payroll report, excuse me, out October 8th. It's the only one that they're going to get between now and November 3rd because the October payroll reports out two days later, November 5th. And so if that number is a big disappointment, then maybe they won't start the taper right away. The street expects 500,000 jobs. I have no idea if 490,000 is a disappointment or if he means 200,000 is a disappointment or where, where, that, where that runs in there, but that's where they've kind of set that up. The Fed upped their inflation forecast. They then said that, you know, they still believe inflation is transitory, but it might be transitory into next year. So, you know, the, the debate with the Fed words is, is inflation transitory? And I guess the flip side of that word is persistent. And it's almost like he said, transitory is going to be a little bit persistent, but don't worry, it's still transitory uh, as well, too. So we'll have to see. But nevertheless, even though they've upped their inflation forecast, they're still not ready to react to higher inflation by thinking that too much money is behind the cause of inflation. And lastly, they did promise us, I thought this was a little bit interesting. They did promise us uh, a paper, a position paper on a digital currency. They first said it would get it in the summer. Then they said we'd get it in early September. He was asked, where's the paper? And he basically announced, look, you know, technology is moving so fast and, the, and the, the crypto space is moving in such a, you know, is the innovation is so mind bending. They can't get their head around it and they're still working on it. And we'll get back to you when we've got it figured out. So they're really struggling to understand the crypto space uh, as well, too. And they're really struggling as to what they're supposed to do about it. All right. Um, I, I do want to talk in more detail about cryptocurrencies later in this interview, because um, there have been some other really interesting recent developments there. Um, but really quickly, just on that positioning paper, is that a paper on sort of the Fed's uh, position against all digital currencies, or is it a paper on a CBDC, like the Federal Reserve's plans to issue one? It was supposed to be a paper on a CBDC that the Fed's plans were to issue one. Now, what it wasn't going to be is what the crypto space calls a white paper. You know, the, the schematic details of how it would work. That's to come later. This was supposed to be about the policy. And let me just lay it out real quick. If the Fed issues a digital dollar, and then the Fed offers everybody a digital wallet to hold your digital dollars in. In other words, you don't need a bank anymore. You can hold your digital dollars directly with the Federal Reserve. There's some concern that that ends the banking system. Why would I keep my money at JP Morgan if I could keep my money with the Fed? A lot of people would go towards that thinking. But then the Fed, you know, but then other people have said, well, they can't do that because they would wreck the banking system. So they'll put restrictions on it. Well, if you put too many restrictions on it, then it's going to be useless as, a, right. as an actual digital currency. That's what the paper was supposed to address. What is it that, what problem are you trying to address? What risks do you have and what are you going to do about it? And they're still struggling to come up with an answer uh, on that. He did throw in today that, you know, talking about the space and about the growth. So it might also be some more of a, you know, their regulatory opinion about the, the cryptocurrency space and hint, 
they don't like it. They want it to go away because it's a threat to the way that the Fed works. Remember that the first rule of a bureaucracy is to keep the bureaucracy intact and in business for as long as possible. Yeah. And this kind of disruption it has the potential to really put them out of business. So guess what? They're against it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't want to rat hole on this, but that's long been um, the confusion that I've had around cryptos with uh, the Federal Reserve is just that you have pre cryptocurrencies, the, the government would intervene to stop anybody. I mean, just the random crank in his garage, you know, minting a couple of silver rounds saying silver rounds saying that it was, you know, his, his new uh, currency out there. Like they just they were allergic to anything that had the whiff of potential competition. And somehow, for whatever reasons, people smarter than me will know they've sort of let the crypto currency uh, ecosystem, uh, you know, grow and begin to thrive. Um, surprised me only because they hate competition so much, they would let that happen. And now, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. And it sounds like they're just really trying to figure out, you know, now what they can do about it. And Jim, guys like you are much smarter to opine on that than, than I am, because you're you're a big follower of the cryptocurrency space. Um, but like I said, I, I don't want to rat hole on that. Um, and we'll get back to cryptocurrencies in a second. But to, to what you talked about, uh, the taper, um, I, I'm going to ask a question I asked earlier, just sort of slightly differently, which is, um, if we take the Fed at face value, that they are indeed going to taper, they've been talking about it forever, the market doesn't really seem to believe them, or at least it hasn't really adjusted prices based upon the expectations the Fed's been, been setting. But, but let's say for a moment the Fed is true to their word, and they do start tapering. Um, we've had previous experts on this program, I'm thinking in particular of Michael Pento, who said, you know, the in his mind, the defining trend of 2022 is going to be we're going to have the biggest monetary and fiscal cliff that, we, that we've ever had in, in history. And, you know, he sees that as being a highly deflationary trend, right, because you have the it just doesn't look like the Fed's going to be able to issue as much currency uh, as it did uh, over the past 18 months. And Congress is having a harder and harder time of getting new fiscal stimulus out there. Um, how how material do you do you think that is? You know, we, we've oh. we've we've cut off the benefits. We're now actually going to be maybe tapering and getting a lot less fiscal stimulus out there. No, I think I think all of those are are definitely the case. Now, one of the reasons the market might be taking the Fed so blasé is the Fed learned from their mistake in 2018. In 2018, they weren't tapering. They went to the next step. They were going to reduce the balance sheet, and they then announced that the reduction of the balance sheet would be, and in Powell's terms, was like automatic pilot, and it's going to be like watching paint dry. And that was a signal to the market, we're going to reduce the balance sheet. Come hell or high water, whatever the data says, you could count that the, ba that the balance sheet is going to keep being reduced. The market freaked out. And then we had two weeks later, the Powell pivot. So what Powell said today was, look, we're going to start to taper, I'm uh, summarizing, we're going to start to taper in November, but that's not the end of the decision. Because then every meeting, we're going to look and see, you know, if the economy weakens, we're going to stop it. Or maybe we'll have to, re we'll have to increase it. Uh, if the economy doesn't, we'll continue. So the market is of the opinion, kind of like it is about with corporate bonds as well, too. Uh, the Fed bought a bunch of corporate bonds to save the market and spreads tightened. And then they stopped buying corporate bonds and then spreads never widened out. And people said, well, why didn't they widen out? They stopped because the Fed already showed that the minute that the market wobbles, they'll be right back. And the Fed has announced we're going to taper, but the minute the market wobbles, the printing presses are going to go right back on. So don't worry. We're going to just we're going to do as much as we can get away with. We're not going to force it on anybody. So that's why I think the market was so blasé about the taper announcement. But to your other question, the fiscal thing, I think, is the miss, the the maybe the biggest blind spot Wall Street has right now. And I got to get a little political here, and I'll try not to go too partisan. But the fact is, over the last two months, Joe Biden's approval rating is down a lot. And you can guess as well as I can, in August, what happened to cause his approval rating to fall a lot. It fell more than Donald Trump's did after the election and around January 6th uh, as well. Yes, it's only about 10 points, but in this highly polarized uh, um, country, that's a big move. What's happening now is that his party, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, Kirsten Sinema of Arizona, are turning events away from him. 
We don't want to spend on your Build Back Better program of three and a half trillion dollars. We're think, rethinking about the infrastructure bill and we want less. And then the progressives are saying, you cut anything out of that program and we're going to vote against it as well, too. And now you've got the debt ceiling coming up. And the Republicans have turned and said, look, you're the majority of everything. We're out. Go ahead, guys. You, you do what you want to do. Uh, and the problem is, if Joe Biden had a 55 percent approval rating, he could he could corral all the cats and get them to fall in line like he did in the spring with his American Recovery Act and the fourteen hundred dollar stimulus check. Although Joe Manchin didn't really want to vote for that, then he wouldn't defy a popular president. But now he's not popular anymore. And now he is defying him. And so we could be running headlong into some kind of de facto austerity because the spending bill becomes just a mess, maybe even bump up against a technical default. Look, at the end of the day, they're going to have to raise the debt ceiling or it's going to end everything. But that doesn't mean that they can't make it a mess before we get there. Although, and what is everybody on Wall Street assuming? Ah, this is all non-issue. This is all a non-issue. It's gonna, it's just gonna be fixed and go away. And they're gonna raise it and vote to raise it. And it's gonna be a bunch of nothing. Well, maybe it will be at the end of the day, but every day it looks like this is getting a lot more complicated than everybody thinks. So yeah, you've got the, the fiscal austerity that might be coming if they can't get the spending bills passed. Uh, you might have also a mess with the debt ceiling too, because that's tied with the bill. They've linked the two together. So one goes with the other. All right. So this is really the meat of what I wanted to talk to you about today. So um, we have uh, exactly that uh, fa facing those challenges here in the states, right, where um, even if they extend the you know, they, they may not extend the debt ceiling and then all hell breaks loose. But even if they do, uh, we're likely seeing a lot less fiscal and monetary stimulus next year. You combine that with how we started the conversation here about what's happening in China and other places in the world where, you know, you said the economy is, is the global economy is slowing down. In the case of China, I found a quote of yours here. Uh, the Chinese economy is hitting the skids hard. Um, so uh, could we be facing, you know, a, a, a big economic slowdown next year globally? And if so, what, what do you think the, the repercussions, the ramifications of that are going to be? Are the markets going to be able to ignore that? Uh, are we going to see lower prices or market correction, job losses? Uh, what do you think? Well, I think we're we're seeing the ramifications of a global slowdown now is really what what it's been happening, and to some extent, the market has been ignoring it because it most shows up as known as the supply chain disruptions. That's where we really where the slowdown is all about, and as it continues to show up as a supply chain disruption, and let me back up and throw out at you that a lot of people, you know, that rethink about the, the, the nature of work and working from home and everything else, you know, you've got a, you've got a whole different mindset. Let's use autos as an example. In the last three or four months, auto sales are down a lot. We've gone from 16 million to 13 million. Normally, when you see that type of drop of auto sales, we've almost always had a recession. But what we've not seen with a drop in auto sales is the price of autos are soaring right now. Uh, the price of new cars, the average new car now is $43,500. And it's up 10% in just the last uh, year. And it's up $1,000 in the last month is, is what's happening. In other words, the global economy is slowing. Chip semiconductors are slowing. Auto production is being cut globally. You ask any auto dealer, they can't get cars. And what do people do that don't have jobs? They walk into the auto dealers and say, I want a car. Well, we only got a few left and you're going to have to pay sticker over sticker. Fine. I want a new car. Used cars are booming in price as well, too. They're, re they're going up at a 30% annualized pace in the last four months uh, as so. So this is what you're starting to see in terms of the economy slowing and the rethink that we've had here with all the fiscal stimulus, right? The economy's slowing. You can't make stuff. We can't get supply. And what are people doing? They're not looking for jobs. They're paying up for everything. I know it's really weird and it's really hard to get your head around because this just would never have happened pre-pandemic that we would have ever seen consumer behavior like this. But so, this so is exactly what we're seeing right now. And that's why I think that, you know, we're, we're, 
I hate to use the word stagflation because it's such a rare thing, but really what we're looking at is potentially people demanding stuff and willing to pay up for it. Houses, real estate is another one that we're doing the same thing as well too with. And yet what we're doing is we're not seeing supply, at least initially, increasing to meet it. Now, the other thing is people always say, well, the supply chain thing would be temporary. We said that in the spring. Well, here we are almost in October and it's worse now than it's ever been. It's not getting better. Now, no, it's not going to last forever, but boy, this is taking a lot longer and a lot more intractable to fix than anybody ever imagined. Yeah, and hopefully coming out of this at some point when the dust settles, you know, nations will hopefully sort of rethink the highly efficient yet highly unresilient, uh, uh, you know, just-in-time supply chains. They're, they're wondrous for certain things, but they, they leave us vulnerable to what we've just been suffering through. Uh, but that's a whole different conversation. Um, so Jim, I, I, I got to ask this. Um, it's a dual question, but it's a short one. Um, one is this head scratching dynamic that you just talked about where everything is, you know, economy is slowing uh, and, uh, but, but and prices are rising and yet people are, who don't have jobs are stepping up and being willing to pay. Um, a, do you see that as transitory, right? In other words, in my mind, I just don't think, how, I don't see how that can last for very long. And it just might be because people still have some cushion left over from all the stimulus that's been given to date. Um, so one, is it transitory? And B, and I'm trying to think of a, of a, of a respectful way to ask this question. Um, so just I'm, just gonna ask it. It, I'm just gonna ask it directly with as much respect as I can muster in my head, but we hope you've been enjoying this discussion with macro researcher, Jim Bianco. The interview continues over in part two, where Jim offers his assessment on the likelihood of a coming correction, as well as which asset classes he favors for the current market environment. He also has a lot more to say about the Federal Reserve, as well as the breaking developments regarding the SEC's tighter stance on cryptocurrencies. To watch part two, just click on the link provided in the description to this video below, or go to youtube.com slash Wealthion. But before you go, please don't forget to hit the like button and then click the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it if you haven't already. It only takes a second and it really does help us out, as the more subscribers this channel has, the more big name experts like Jim we can attract onto this program in the future. Oh, and if you'd appreciate a free, no strings attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who can help manage your portfolio with the risks and opportunities that Jim has highlighted here, just go to Wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. Okay, I'll see you over at part two of our video interview with Jim Bianco.